So welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us. And you just said, this is the first of our idea of putting forward some webinars. And well, I'm taking this as a nice opportunity to discuss in an informal environment uh, of what's going on and, and being able to really talk about developments and, and results and also failures in, in the process. Why not? And what I'm going to talk about is this, this, this so-called minimal gauge which is a coordinate system for hyperboloid slice that I've been using, uh, which is based on this recent uh, archive preprint here that I put forward, which is curious because this, this came also as a consequence of a workshop that Juan organized in, at the Royal Society in May. So I think it's a nice connection for, for with what Juan did. And so a quick outline here, we just go brief about motivation. And, go through the historical development of what I mean calling the minimal gauge and finish kind of with a practical recipe to construct these slides uh, before, before concluding and perhaps discussing some projects. And the motivation here, I think we're in a small group that perhaps most of us are already motivated or, or enough to think about what's hyperboloid slice uh, in, in Space time. So I will take a rather different motivation kind of approach, which is I've been recently reading this book from Umberto Eco called The Foucault's Pendulum. And there was this sentence that got my attention that, that he wrote right in the beginning, where he says, Well, that's why the pendulum disturbs me, because it promises the infinity. But where to put the infinity is left to me. So the, the character says, It isn't enough to worship the pendulum. You still have to make a decision. You still have to find the best point for it. And yet, well, I think in our context, it comes like, well, that's why the conformal factor disturbs me, you know, because it promises the infinity, but where to put this infinity is a bit left to us. And I don't want to be alone here. I mean, left to us as community. So it isn't enough really to worship the conformal factor. We still have to make a decision. We still have to find the best point for it. And yet, well, let's see. So the idea here is we know, I mean, formally, geometrically, uh, abstractly, how to map the infinities of a space time, right? I mean, if you have a physical manifold, we can conformally map into some unphysical manifold where the infinity is going to be the boundary, where the conformal factor vanishes. But sometimes we have to make decisions. Uh, to see where this infinity is. And for us, for me here, the decision is, well, working in a particular type of coordinates, the hyperboloidal one, and within the hyperboloidal, a particular gauge choice within them and fixing in, in black hole space times. So that's kind of my starting point. I think it was a nice quote for him when I read. So as I said, I mean, we're going to be discussing possible hyperboloidal gauges uh, in black hole space times. Typically, naturally, in textbooks, what we learn, what we see are those in the Schwarzschild coordinates or Poirier-Linquis, if you are in care. And we want to com construct somehow compactified hyperbolic coordinates. And a very, very brief overview, fly over some of the, the literature. I think, well, this has been around the different formats and flavors here and there. So I can think of the works from, from, from Istvan since 2003. Uh, that uses some sort of, of hyperboloidal coordinates. Then Anil was also very active doing a lot of stuff and Beck now also very active. And Anil had a very influence in the field. I mean, collaborated with many people. Uh, still nowadays, what he was doing back then, Justin has also used some of the coordinates that Anil has been suggesting. Uh, back then, Marcus and I, kind of Marcus joined and, and had his own kind of idea and approach. And, and that's when I joined. Recently, I also learned a little bit of, of the work from, from Lars and Thomas, uh, more on the mathematical side. Not to mention also all the efforts on trying to find coordinates to be able to do some numerical evolutions in the full nonlinear regime. This, well, goes back perhaps to Peter Hubner in the 90s. Then at some point, Oliver uh, Buchmann, Marcus and I also were, and, and David Schinkel, trying to solve the constraints equations at some point. Well, Anil was also trying to solve the full nonlinear stuff. But nowadays, I think the main groups that are pushing this are the people around collaborating. So I just beat to hear the main names, but there are more people around, of course. Uh, groups in Portugal with, with, with David, Alex, and, and, and Edgar, and also the 
New Zealand group with, with York, Florian, and, and Chris Stevens. So my focus here was kind of my historical approach, how I joined things when I joined Marcus and, and how I kind of grow from him, from his insights into the whole field. So let's keep first things very, very generic uh, and start with a static spherical symmetric in background. And I'm trying to keep as generic as possible. I mean, choosing the radar coordinates such that we could even have two different functions here in the GTT and DRR part. And the idea is to construct somehow this compact hyperbolic low coordinates uh, based on this describe fixing approach that, that Anil suggested, modifying the notation, but it's the same concept. So essentially what happens here is, well, we literally just changing coordinates between T and R into tau and sigma. Uh, with some features that I like to keep track. So first of all, there is this lambda that I like. It's, it's just a length scale. It can be the mass. It can be the horizon radius. You can choose eventually. But I like to really keep track of a length scale just because I can do dimensional analysis in an easier way. I can compare to some numerical results where they put M to 1. And, and this is a particular choice for the length scale. So I like to have this length scale floating around. It helps me to control the calculations. Important here is perhaps this height function, this h, which is the one that's going to deform, that's going to change the time coordinate into the so-called hyperboloidal coordinates here. And of course, there is something that we need to do to compactify the radial direction. So here I'm compactifying directly by r equals 1 over sigma. And there is this function, which is a free function that we perhaps can choose which will be related to the conformal area radius, as I will show. And you can also think either by prescribing something here, or also if you like to think in terms of the tortoise coordinate, we can always think that, well, there is a dimension of a tortoise coordinate associated with the sigma here. So when you do this, this enters this whole conformal uh, approach in which the physical space time here, this is the usual, I can just con directly conformally rescale with a conformal factor omega and end up with a regular uh, metric. So a bit fancy, I'm going to talk about what this regular part is. But the important thing is that there is a choice here. I'm picking up this particular conformal factor. So within this thing of choosing somehow where to put infinity, there is, first of all, the zero decision here that I'm essentially using the conformal factor as the radial coordinate itself. So the background is fixed. It's just easy to do this. It's there for us. I can just pick up the, the conformal factor as the radial coordinate. Now, if we look to this more fancy structure here for the metric, I mean, in the beginning, there was just A and B as functions. Now there is this bunch hole of functions here that looks a bit more complicated. But we can still keep track of what information it quantity gives us. So first of all, there is this radial degrees of freedom that we can control to compactify things. So this essentially comes on how we choose this row here. So row appears here in terms of the angular part. It's just the area radius in the conformal picture. And it's going to be popping up, and it's going to be important Later on, as I will show, this particular combination here, which I'm calling beta. And this comes naturally if I want to calculate dr d sigma. This part here comes when I'm calculating dr d sigma. So it's just easier to, first of all, to call this beta because it simplifies things. And it will help us also to make a decision soon enough. So this is where I control the radial degrees of freedom. Now, there are some properties that come from the space-time itself. As I said, there are these two functions in the original metric A and B, which I'm just recombining here into F as the square root of A and B, or zeta as the square root of A over B. Why I do this? Well, essentially, F gives us the information where, where the horizons are. So whenever F vanishes, we have a horizon. So in most of the cases that we know, A and B are the same. So this is just the function that comes in a uh, spherical symmetric space time. Um, and, and also in most of the cases, zeta is just one. So I don't know how to call this function here. 
I'm just calling, calling this the fancy part of the metric. I mean, if if the line element is, if the space-time is very intricate, then perhaps A and B are different, then zeta won't be one, but uh, for the typical case that, that we work with, zeta is just one. Now, where do we see this, these quantities appearing within this, this zoo, this mess is, first of all, there is this function P here in the dt square part, which is just defined as the derivative of the tortoise coordinate with respect to the new sigma. So it's just one over x prime. And this essentially has the information of f. Okay, there is sigma square, so p vanishes at infinity, and asymptotically flat space-time. Beta is just coordinate here, so the important information about the space-time is at f. And there is also this prefactor here, this, this capital Xi, which I can geometrically see as the determinant of the tau sigma sector. So eta here for me is this the tau sigma sector. So psi is just the determinant of this piece. Uh, and this is going to carry the information about, well, how fancy, so to say, the metric is. Again, beta comes here just as some freedom that is there, but here's information about the metric. And finally, there are informations that comes from how we do the time transformation, coming from how we choose the height function. And this is something that Anil called the boost function in one of his papers. So it's just the derivative of the height function with respect to the tortoise coordinate. So in terms of sigma is this combination. So this kind of covers all degrees of freedom, two from the space time, two from the coordinate transformation. But there is still left the function omega here. This is still not kind of fixed because it's not free, so to say. It's just a combination of gamma and p. Okay, so this is kind of giving some meaning to each one of these functions. We can also give meaning to the geometrical uh, properties, to the causal structure of the conformal space-time. So this means by, well, we can look at what are the outgoing null vectors. We can look at what are the ingoing null vectors. And we can also look at what are the normal vectors to this t constant surface. So these three vectors here are enough for us to get a feeling of what's going on with the space-time. And essentially, we want to construct hyperboloidal surfaces in this space-time. So by that, we mean that we want actually to align to see the time flow here, the partial tau, as generator of the null surface, a horizon, no infinity. So the idea is that we want to align either the outgoing null vector with partial tau, or we want to align the ingoing null vector with partial tau. S to do this in either or circumstances, we need to have this gamma going to one so that the sigma contribution vanishes. And we just have this aligning with partial t or partial, or partial tau in either of these cases. The second thing that we want for this hyperboloidal surface is that this is constant. Uh, the, the tau constant, they are space-like everywhere uh, within the domain that we are working at least. So when this comes, if we look at the normal surface, so the normal vector has to be time-like uh, so that the surface is space-like, which means that W here has to be always positive if we want the surface to be space-like. And these two properties, they are not really disconnected from one to the other. So they are there together because as I said, W is really a combination of some other metric functions, P and gamma. So as you see, I mean, I want to W to be regular and positive. So this quantity here has to be regular. And at some null surface, well, at not some, at the null surface, P vanishes is the horizons, for instance, or for some non-infinity. So if I want W to be regular when P is going to zero, then this guy better be going to plus and minus one. So these two properties kind of come together. And the picture that we are looking at is something like this. I mean, if I have a conformal diagram at the, the Penrose triangle here, we have fusion of infinity. I want to align, for instance, the ingoing null vector with partial tau here. I will have the light cone pointing completely outwards of my domain with L pointing there, and the normal vector being time-like between inside the null cone 
And this property is kept everywhere inside this light until I reach the horizon, where in the horizon I align the ingoing null vector, uh, the outgoing points. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. My not So I align the outgoing null vector here, L, the ingoing pointing inside whatever this is, and I have the normal vector also keeping this slice space-like. So this is the picture of all these geometrical properties. Now let's just construct something that has these properties in Schwarzschild. And here comes the, the historical perspective when I joined uh, Jena with Marcus. And he had he, he found his own way of constructing the slide within his intuition, which was, OK, so we know this space, this, this line here. We also know how to go to ingoing no coordinates. We have this in every textbook, just chained for V, because this for sure is going to ensure that the coordinates are, well, this is an English mistake here, the coordinates are horizon penetrating. Uh, but the problem is that if I keep myself at these V surfaces, if I go to asymptotic region, I'm going to reach past null infinity. And that's not what we want to do. We want to reach future null infinity. So he said, well, within this structure, let's look at what happens with the outgoing light rays. This is just showing the equations, which I don't have to look everywhere. I just have to look asymptotically near infinity and just solve this equation near infinity. It gives me a constant here, and I'm going to choose this constant to be my time coordinate. This was his, his intuition. And finally, well, we need to compactify the space time. So let's just go with a very simple compactification. Let's just say that R is one over sigma. I just put, as I said, infinity to zero, horizon to one, and that's it. That was his intuition. It worked. It's nice. It's eventually also quite simple what we end up having as a line element. It's just a polynomial here. I mean, third order, vanishing at scribe, vanishing at the horizon. This is the P function that I was saying. Uh, this is the W that's always positive, sigma from zero to whatever, positive. Um, so everything, the properties of gamma, it goes to plus minus one if sigma is zero or one here with the aligning, the null vectors, as I was saying. So everything satisfied. We have our hyperbola foliation here. So if you want to see what we have here, I mean, if you think that this was a generic transformation, this function here is just a constant. And I was talking about this beta. I'm going to bring this back soon enough. Beta is also a constant with this construction. I can see what essentially is the tortoise coordinate. Okay, dimensionless, but still the tortoise coordinate. It is the one from textbooks rewritten with sigma, but tortoise coordinate as in textbooks. And for the time degree of freedom, where we have the height function, the height function has this structure here. And this is kind of a first hint that I realized a few months ago, well, last year, I guess, it is just changing the sign here. I will come back to this in the future, in the last slides, but just keep in mind that, well, tortoise coordinate, we know from textbooks, height function, it's not that different here in this setup. I mean, it's just changing sign, but nothing fancy, nothing complicated. It's just changing the sign here within this recipe. So yeah, Marcus came with this idea. Marcus had this intuition. It was working for what, what we are doing. And then I started to try to see, solve equations, see the literature in quadrant modes. And there is this famous work from Lever where he provides a numerical algorithm to calculate quadrant modes in black hole space time. So the way to work is, well, we use, we start in the usual T and R coordinates. And usually we solve these sort of equations, uh, Rigel-Hiller, Zerilli type of equations, for instance. And well, people go to the Fourier domain, for instance, just making an exponential ansatz in terms of the Fourier frequency. There is a function for this, for this piece here in R. We have an ODE. And it comes now, this comes a piece that people has to study, understand asymptotic behaviors and make an ansatz based on physics, an ansatz basis on the theory of OGE uh, equations. And so what he does is he suggests a prefactor here that's going to take into account 
boundary properties times a function that should be regular according to leave approach. And this function, because it's regular, he can expand around the horizon and find properties and algorithms to solve for whatever he was looking for, the cosmological modes. Now, we are going to our tau sigma coordinates, our compact hyperboloidal coordinates. The first thing is just to identify, well, the field here, it acts as a scalar field. I mean, I'm just transforming uh, the coordinate itself. I mean, there is nothing, I don't have to worry anything else apart from just changing the coordinates. So it's literally just chain rules from here to something which is still in the wave equation. I mean, minus second derivative in tau, operator in radial, operator in radial. I mean, it's a bit more complicated than this structure, but it's also tractable and, and with some intuition to be gained from these operators. At this level, chain rule, coordinate change. And we follow the recipe. We can do a Fourier transform. Now, Fourier transform in the tau coordinate, I'm calling S just because it's a different parameter, and something which is regular. But this function here, this, this equation is defined already within the conformal setup. I mean, everything here is regular by construction, by the whole framework. So, well, we can go to the Fourier transform and have, of course, the OGE equation in sigma here for this quantity. But because everything is regular, we can skip actually this piece here and go straight to a Taylor expansion around the horizon with some eventually other coefficients. And we can do this generically. We can do this to whatever hyperboloidal choice that we want to do. But we can look this in particular, well, for whatever, as I say, for whatever coordinate. So let's do this for whatever, uh, for a very generic possibility. So I'm just identifying these two fields, Fourier transform in one side, Fourier transform in the other side. I just use what is really the expression for T here with tau and height function. And I can kind of kill off the time dependence here for the Fourier because this S I identify with omega. So essentially you just get a relation between the field in the original R coordinates in terms of the regular coming from the conformal approach times a prefactor that is generically given from a generic height function, which should be taking care of the boundary conditions. And I said, I mean, this is generic. I could be putting any height function that is available out there but I choose to use the one that Marcus was suggesting, this mass, the, the, the Unsorg recipe, both the radial transformation and the height function. And what I see is, well, this is exactly, exactly, exactly what Lever did back in the 90s. So, so the takeaway message here is that whatever Lever was doing back in 85, and this is a quite, quite important work in the literature for astronomical modes. So, Lever regulars field is simply the frequency domain representation of our hyperboloidal perturbation field in this, well, I'm already anticipating the name here in the minimal gauge, let's call in the Unzorg's recipe at first. So this is a nice way I said, well, okay, this looks nice. This looks simple. Uh, it also kind of connects with works in the literature. Why not take my decision? And well, from now on, I will just follow his recipe because there is some intuition on how to construct. It's a simple result. It connects with liver. So the recipe is, well, I first go to ingoing no coordinates. I integrate the asymptotic outgoing light rays. I choose this integration constant as a time coordinate and I choose a simple compactification function. Voila, I have what I, what I want. So yeah, I'm excited. I go move on. I go to Hazard and Nordstrom. Here is quick, I follow the recipe. So I have to make a decision, right? You have to find the best option, the best point for it. In going no coordinates, nice. Asymptotic expansion, nice. Choose the coordinate, nice. Simple compactification, perfect. Finally, I mean, everything works, hyperboloidal, beautiful. And yet, well, I try to go up again, back to liver, 99, said, yeah, it has to be the same, right? I have, if I follow what I was getting before, if I plug in here, this height function that I'm getting, I should recover what Lever did in the 90s for Heisen and Nordstrom. So I put these transformations from the Unsorg recipes, I put the height function, and 
I compare what what liver was doing. Now, there are prefactors here. Take into account infinity, horizon, Cauchy horizon, and I get frustrated. So they don't agree. So I was, what the hell is going on? What's why is not working? Why this is not there? And even worse, I mean, it seemed to me that within the approach by Lever, his expressions were a bit simpler than what I was getting. So I was, yeah, I mean, there is something weird here, but I was, it must be somehow. But there was a benefit coming from our side. So whatever Lever was doing, it was failing. It fails, actually, if I take a direct limit to the extremal case. It doesn't really work. You have to stop, go to extremo, and start from scratch. You cannot take really a direct limit into this it. And if I follow this approach, if I pick up the boundary conditions within this recipe, well, I can really go, even though the expression becomes a bit more complicated, but I can just go all the way to the extremal case. So this recipe doesn't have this limitation, whereas liver one does. So there was this balance of, huh, don't agree, liver is simpler, but he cannot get to the extremal case directly. So I was like, oh, I mean, this doesn't look good. Anyhow, uh, let me take a step back and uh, try to see what are the structures here in this recipe. So first of all, let's keep with going to the nil coordinate as a first step. And now let's introduce here this compact hyperboloidal ansatz. So in the diagram is, I'm starting with the t constant. I'm going to this, uh, in going to coordinate here that gets the horizon, but gets to past infinity. And I want to change now things so that I can get to the tau constant. So I integrate the outgoing light rays. So the third step is equivalent here to align partial t with the vector k. So when I go to past to, to infinity, I don't want to align the outgoing vector. I want to align the ingoing vector. So I want to align k partial tau, but because we are in the reg in the conformal picture, I want to ensure that this vector is regular there. So these two things are equivalent. And this gives me conditions on the height function here. So there are minimal structure that has to appear such that these conditions is there. And there are extra terms that in principle I can choose at will as I wish. Minimal gauge for me means, okay, I just throw away <laughs> all these extra uh, quantities here. And finally, this last step that's been hanging around, which is a notion for a simple compactification. So ideally, this looks simple enough, but uh, this cross was anticipating that I'm not going to really follow this. So this is one possibility, but not the only one. So the notion from simple compactification, I'm going to take out from the differential part. So if I say that to have a very simple compactification, it means that the dr is just d sigma over sigma square as it comes from here. But this means that the function beta is a constant, actually. Uh, and this gives me some freedom when I choose this row here. So I can choose row being a first order polynomial, and I still have this beta constant so that dr d sigma is just one over sigma square. So the notion of simple compactification is a slightly more generic than just this one, is beta constant, which allows me for some freedom on this row function. And this really kind of solves my life in the Heisenberg-Nordstrom and also for care. So take a look at what we have, time, time, I just pick up the minimal requirement to have whatever I have, there is a chat, five minutes, oh, I, I, I'm late. Uh, and okay, let's go. Uh, what, what I was doing here is, first of all, I was putting row one to zero, right? Just picking up this very, very, very scene. What happens with the causal structure here? Schwarzschild, so this kappa here is just a parameter for the charge, is the ratio between the, the two horizons. So it measures the charge, so to say. So the Schwarzschild has capital to zero, Cauchy horizon is actually singularity. And I have, so infinity being mapped to zero, horizon being mapped to one, and zero being mapped to infinity in the, in the sigma. If I put some charge, what happens is that the horizon is still being mapped to one, 
the Cauchy horizon is being mapped to some value finite here. And when I go to the extremal case, both of them are mapped into one as we expect in the extremal case. Now, because I have this freedom, I can choose another thing. I can fix the Cauchy horizon at a point. So I can prevent this from move around. So I can keep the event horizon and keep mapping this to one. Singularity is at infinity at first. If I put charge or spin, well, I have a new event horizon that comes to one, but the Cauchy horizon in this way, I can still be coming to infinity. So when I get the extremal case, this is not, this is ill defined. I cannot really get into there. And this can be seen because, well, the radio transformation in the extremal case is ill defined. The line element has all these terms which become ill defined the extremal case. But I can add another transformation which is ill defined, which together makes things that's regular with a transition into the so called near horizon geometry. So this is the Robertson Bertotti metric for Heisner and Armstrong, which has a topology with ADS S2. So it's a more complicated geometry within the near horizon uh, geometry for these things. And now we can go back to what Lever was doing. So if I follow the recipe in one way of fixing the radial coordinate where the Cauchy horizon moves around, then I don't get, but I can get the limit straight away to the extremal case. If I change in this way of the Cauchy fix, it's still in this mind frame of minimal gauge, I reproduce Lever's work, uh, and then there is a sketch, because so far the interpretation was, well, Lever proposes an algorithm that fails in the extreme, extremal case, and that's it. So here we have a space-time understanding that it, we don't reach the extremal case, because if we go to the space-time representation, if we go to the hyperboloidal, we are moving into a discontinuous transition into the near horizon. So it allows us to understand what's going on with some of the algorithms. So, okay, I was happy. I was going, well, let me try again with another space-time, uh, the one that I've been working recently with Vitor. That should be describing um, a massive black hole with a dark matter halo. And the important thing is, well, this is, has two functions, A and B, that don't agree. And I was, okay, let's find a decision, pick up the best point, follow, in going all coordinates, compactify the hyperboloidal, choose the minimum requirement, pick up a very simple quantum quantification. And yet, well, huh, this space-time has this feature, as I said, A and B, they are not the same. Okay, fair enough, it's making things complicated, but the tricky part there is the question, are the, sp the, the surface space-like? Is W positive everywhere? And if I plot W for some parameters that controls the solution, it's becoming negative within this recipe. So the recipe wasn't working. I was again frustrated. So what we can try to do here. So this is an approach that I was calling now in and out strategy. So I started with the in and then I go to the out. So I was, I thought, well, let's just change. Let's keep the same mindset, but changing the approach. Let's go first of all, go to the outgoing coordinates so that I reach uh, future infinity. Let's compactify as I was doing. Let's pick up the minimal things so that I can align the, the, the light rays. Let's compactify. And this is something that I'm calling the out in strategy. It goes in the other way around. I first go to the out node coordinates and then I see the asymptotic behavior of the ingoing light rays. So this is the out in strategy that I'm using right now. And when I do this, what was becoming negative, everything becomes, this is the dashed line here. W is positive. I have my, as desired, my hyperboloidal slices space-like everywhere as I want it to be. So to finish this, I also have another mistake here. So we want to construct this compactified hyperboloidal in the minimal gauge. Uh, essentially, we can just be looking. There is this, this, this framework that I said, well, go to the in, integrate the outgoing or go to the outgoing and integrate the in. Ah, okay, I mean, this, this, this gives some intuition, but at the end of the day, there is a recipe that we can just follow. So we try to pick up the tortoise coordinate as in a textbook. So 
This tortoise coordinate has some singular parts, logarithms that are going to diverge at the horizon or at future infinity, and it might have a regular part. And we can identify piece by piece what these are. I mean, you can just go to the paper and see the equations. You can identify contributions from infinity, contribution from horizon, and eventually regular part. So the simple compactification that I said is just picking up beta constant. We have still this slightly freedom here. What happens in the in-out strategy is, well, in a very, very practical way, if I have the tortoise coordinate, in the end of the day, I just have to change the sign from the piece at infinity. Or if I go to the out-in strategy, I just have to change the sign from the infinity and the regular piece. So if the regular piece is a constant, both approaches are equivalent, doesn't really matter. But if they are not constant, the out-in strategy, from all the experiments that I've been doing, it always works. It has always found a hyperboloidal slice that satisfies all the properties uh, with this rather simple strategy and also, I would say, simple uh, intuitive process. So yeah, I'll keep doing this one here. So conclusions, just this historical review of how I've been working with this, what I'm calling minimal gauge. Uh, there is this interpretation that I can connect with the works from Lever, that I can understand what he was doing in terms of this space time, in terms of this geometrical picture. At the end of the day, you just have to flip the signs in the tortoise coordinate to construct this hyperboloidal foliation. And my empirical observation, I don't have a formal proof, is that there is always exist a well-defined hyperboloidal in this out-in strategy. So, but as I said, I mean, it is something that has been constructed just playing around with coordinate change. There is no really covariant classification. I mean, it's not like CMC. I, I have a geometrical quantity that I define what the slice is. So here it's perhaps there exists, I don't know. Uh, but it's it's a concept that comes from changing coordinates. And there are some products here that we can talk about, but I think the time is a bit on the on the on the edge. So thanks a lot. <laughs>